Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddy Network podcast. My guest today is John Flack, a cognitive scientist, and this is going to be a great conversation. Our little lead up to the uh, recording has um, just opened up so many thoughts in my mind. And John, thank you for being here and being with us. And um, tell us a little bit about who you are, and and then uh, we'll jump into some topics. Yeah, so actually, maybe we should qualify that definition and say I'm an applied cognitive scientist or, Ooh, or psychologist. Better. And um, and to understand that oftentimes when the academics, when they tell say that you're applied, they mean not a real scientist at all. <laughs> um, but my career uh, from the very early stages is looking at applying in complex work. And early work was on pilots. And, you know, what is it the that a skilled pilot sees that none of us, that the rest of us don't see, and 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 then if we understand what the very skilled pilots know and see, how can we train novices to be more like them? So I, I like to characterize much of my work as I go into people's domains and and talk to the experts to find out how it is that experts do things that are not possible for, for mere humans try to understand the heuristics, the things, the attention. So experts tend to attend to things and see things that, you know, to many of us seem like a jumble confusion, and they actually see patterns there, and they utilize those patterns very effectively. So expert, and, and talking and about part it. of our work is... Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, good. And I said, so part of our work in uh, uh, currently... I work for a software company is is building interfaces that try to represent some of the things that make things salient that are important to experts, but make them salient in a way that people who are not so expert, you know, can see without spending 10, 10 or 15 years to become an expert. So I was gonna, I was going to say that it, it sounds like an ex, an expert is someone who is specialized in the field and that they have. Um, demonstrated their expertise above the other experts in their field. Is that kind of the way it ends up being? Uh, so, well, certainly there are the levels of exper experts, but but yet generally experts, you know, not only do they, uh, they're, they're smarter, they're, they're faster, they're, they, a lot of times, well, so one of my mentors, you know, a lot of time when you go into a, a field and you look at what people are doing, and compare it to kind of classical rationality or things, you're a little bit puzzled. And they're doing strange things because they see things that we don't, they're aware of constraints that are totally invisible to us. And they're responding to stimuli that, that most of us who, ha who don't have the same experience don't see. And so that, and, you know, it either looks like sometimes illogical and uh, when we see how effective it is, it, it often looks like magic. Um, and that's kind of, my job as an applied psychology is to to go and try to understand the magic and and say it's not it's not magic it's not necessarily in the expert's head so much as its sensitivity to information in the world that all of us could learn to see um if we had the same experience as the expert and and again what we try to do is shortcut that experience by making those things that are important to experts more salient to the rest of us kind of pulling that out the signals out of the noise if you if you would, does does this come out of the um, the world of um, the philosophical world of phenomenology, where the sensory inputs that people gain from being focused on a particular thing over a long period of time begin to teach them things because that become more intuitive, a more um, a, a more present to them, it, you know, it's obvious to them. They see it. Nobody else sees it because they've kind of been immersed in this in a much more than simply uh, in a, an analytical way. Yes, it's, it's very much related. So, you know, one of the things tools we use is knowledge elicitation. So, one thing is is to go in and talk to experts and 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 actually have them describe to you what they're looking at and seeing while they're doing the work. Um, but oftentimes experts become so good that a lot of the the knowledge they have is tacit so um they can't even tell you how they do what they do 
So, yeah. you know, they, they see it and they respond to it. And, 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 you know, sometimes they try to explain what they're doing, but oftentimes they can't put it into words. Why? And that's, that's sometimes the greatest athletes who can do it aren't the best coaches because they know how to do it, but they don't know how they do it. They don't know how to explain what they do in a way that that's good for teaching others. It, re it reminds me of, um, you know, Michael Pogliani's little uh, phrase that we know things that we cannot tell. We, we don't know the source yeah. of, the, of the knowledge, but we, it's the knowledge. And he, and he, he calls that personal knowledge because it's. Yeah. And tacit knowledge is another term knowledge. that's used for that. Yeah. I, I, I read a lot of him 40 years ago and it, you know, it's kind of stuck and I, it's kind of the way I, I view the world. Um, and, and how does, how does someone uh, become an expert in this way? What is there? Let me, let me kind of be clear of what I'm trying to ask. I'm curious about if someone decided they wanted to be an expert in the manner that you're describing, what is the pathway that they would need to take to, to arrive at that place? Uh, repetition. It's hard work. It's doing it. It's showing up over and over again. And, you know, there, there's actually quite a debate between, you know, uh, about talent. You know, so a lot of times when we see these people, and, and again, these experts see things that we don't see, they do things that seem magical to us, and we're often likely to attribute it to a natural talent. And, you know, and, and there certainly are prodigies and things, but, but I think more and more the opinion is, is that uh, most of us can do things, you know, like so one of the things I'm trying to do is, is learn how to play guitar. And I've always convinced myself, well, I don't have that talent. But I've discovered if you just keep doing it over and over every day, and, and it helps to have a good teacher. But with lots of repetitions, all of a sudden, you find yourself seeing things and, and sensitive to patterns that you weren't sensitive before. This is, there's no shortcut. The answer is that it takes about 10 years in a domain. So, you know, to become a, a grandmaster in chess, it takes 10 years, you know, playing intensively, playing lots of games, reading chess books, you know, it takes that much experience to become a real expert in a domain. And that would be more than Michael Gladwell's 10,000 hours to be an expert. Yeah, again, that's a rule of thumb. And all of these things are, are rules of thumb. And, and it's, uh, these rules focus on time. But the, the other thing we want to say is it's not time, simply time. So right. there's a difference and there's a term that's called deliberate practice. And that means, you know, paying attention to what you're doing, working on the, your weaknesses, you know, being aware of your weaknesses and actually deliberately doing things that are hard to do over and over again that, that you might not like to do. And this is where coaching becomes very important. So it takes, it takes discipline or, or the term in the literature is deliberate practice to really become an expert. You know, when I um, became a consultant, organizational leadership consultant um, in the mid '90s, I'd never been a consultant, never run a business, so I I didn't know anything except I knew how to talk to people. And over about five years, I began to see patterns of behavior, and those patterns, you know, if you put it on a spectrum. The spectrum of organizations from small to large corporate size, that there was a consistency across that spectrum. And the consistency was lack of clarity and thought, lack of respect and trust in relationships, and the inability to describe what the impact of the company should be. And those three things became the kind of the, the, the building blocks for everything else I've done ever since. And and, uh, the, you know, uh, and I keep asking the question, I keep asking the question, so the repetition is right. So why is it that these three things keep emerging everywhere I turn? And, uh, and, it, and it ultimately came back to what I was finding was that there's a, there's a, the effect of an organizational structure on people is, um, is the reason. And that I couldn't find anybody who, would, who understood that because the structure was kind of like, water to a fish fish doesn't know what water is and human beings don't know, understand structure because it's it's the thing that envelops their entire life but but i was able to see that and uh, and recognize that 
you know, and now and now we talk about that in terms of the mechanical kind of organizational structure versus the organic or the relational organic uh, structure, and that and that so th so now we're kind of moving into in the world that I have been seeing for for, for a couple of decades there, and and so that's that's sort of a coming to an understanding of seeing something that um, you have been to communicate to other people, I think is really the challenge. So how do, how do the how do these experts learn to communicate those things that they see and maybe they're the only ones who see it? Yeah, well, I think there's two things about related to that I, I'd respond to. The first is that the patterns are there. So the patterns aren't in your head. The patterns are in the organizations. And and the second thing, it, you know, and then and it takes time to see them. So that, that these these pattern to see a pattern, patterns evolve over time. And mm -hmm. so the pattern mean it, patterns are not in time, they're over time. So it takes time to rec to see the pattern. And then and then the so a lot of people. So there, there's different stages of expertise. So the first thing is you begin to recognize the patterns and 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 perhaps react to them. So for example, a lot of people might be sensitive to those patterns, but they can't be put them into words the way you have. So so they might go into an organization and say, hey, this feels really bad and I can see bad things happening. Mm -hmm. But they can't tell you why. They just say, I get a bad feeling with these people or there's something there's something not right here. Right. Um, but you've taken the other step and 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 where other people can is is then actually being able to put what you're sensitive to, the patterns out there, and then to describe them in a way that uh, other people can understand or 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 you actually can begin to utilize that and you know articulate that and, and use that understanding in a more uh, conscious way rather than an unconscious. Because a lot of our expertise and, and much of my work is in early work was in perceptual motor skills and things like catching baseballs and hitting baseballs and things like, and, and landing an airplane and keeping on the right glide slope and stuff. And most of the people who are high performance in those motor skills, they can do it, but they can't tell you how they do it. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of ours trying to figure out how to do it. And, and again, that's the difference between the great athlete who can respond and hit the baseball and stuff and the great coach who can actually, you know, train people and, and perhaps articulate and tell people, explain to people how they can perform better. Um, yeah. The, the best athletes are not always the best coaches. So, so they don't get to the level where, you know, they, they are sensitive to the patterns, they respond to the patterns, but they, for them, the information is tacit and they can't articulate it. So they never reach the the good coaching stage, even though they could be the, a premier athlete in their sports. Well, it, you know, this raises a question for me. Let me back up and say this. What I see you describing is the way I feel like we should be learning as human beings to function in the world. This This development of this tacit knowledge is uh you know the more the more we have of that the greater functioning we will have in the world and it and there's that tacit knowledge becomes something we can transfer to other domains you know not just the thing that we're learning but there's something about the, the that learning ha that has um kind of a, a universal or a generalist of, of approach to that so how we have approached education in in the Western world, how has that either contributed or, or made it more difficult to learn in this way? Well, I, I, this is just a hypothesis, but you know, one of the things that, that you also said is, you know, you describe these things, but a lot of people can't understand, you know, that you can put into words and, and maybe some people get it, but a lot of people don't get it. And so one hypothesis is that the people who get it is because they've already seen it. They see it, but they didn't have the right words. And so when you put it into words, they can recognize, oh yes, that's what I've seen. And and it's and it's reassuring. But the 
the question, I guess, in my mind is, do they recognize the value of your words because they've already discovered it tacitly on their own? And, and this would suggest that the best teachers experience that is some of these things. So, and, and we, we can say this absolutely for sports. So you can't become a great tennis player by reading about tennis and talking about tennis, right? And, you know, we think about higher cognitive skills and problem solving and math and, and things as something that we can communicate in the teaching. And, and we often think about teaching as transferring knowledge from one head to the other. And, and it's almost as if, the experience of the students is not important. It's only the experience of the teacher that matters. But I, I think I would argue that actually the, the mental skills are not different than the physical skills. And that we don't, we don't learn skills and high, high levels of performance in any domain without the reps. And, and again, I think Again, it's and it's not purely reps. Again, it, it's got to be deliberate practice, and so that's where the coaching comes in, is they can guide the practice. But you know, we we tend to think about coaching different than teaching, as if they're different things. And I think they're exactly the same thing. And I, and I think the problem, I think our classrooms would be more effective if the teachers function more as coaches. Mm -hmm. Than teachers, because again, teachers is it, that when much of the teaching is organized around the content, that the and and it's really about memorizing facts. It's transferring knowledge from one head to the other, but that's not a good way to develop skills. And again, I I think our our schools would be much more effective if our teachers kind of framed their job more the way a a coach thinks about training an athlete, rather than you know again filling, you know, we're not filling up heads. We are creating opportunities for people to get the right experiences that they need to discover the patterns for themselves. So if a world-class athlete is, is probably not the best choice to be a coach, then what is it, what do you, what should we be looking for in a coach that would be to our greatest advantage? Yeah. So uh, Again, if I, I guess if I put into word, maybe mindfulness is is the is the word. So you know, again, the person who just loved to play over and over again, um, they're going to get very good. Again, the reps are important, and so play it over again. But uh, there's also a certain mindfulness of kind of curiosity about how I am. You know, some people are just more curious about how they're able to do it than others, and might be. And in some cases, it might actually be the people who, who have more difficulty with mm -hmm. the reps and, and have a harder time getting it. And so they think, I mean, I think that's part of why I ended up where I am is, you know, I always wanted to be a great athlete and I have perceptual motor skills. You know, I, I didn't want to be a psychologist. I wanted to be a quarterback, but I was way too small. <laughs> so I was still just hitting about 100 pounds by myself, too, too small. Um, but I also, I guess, was a little bit lazy. And when I looked at the people who were doing really good, I kind of thought, what do they know that I don't know? And instead of doing the reps, <laughs> I was, I started trying to think what their secret was. And that's why I went to kind of psychology, looking for the secret, the skill and, and things. And I, I studied skill, but I didn't, uh, do the, the reps in, in any particular domain to, to become skilled myself in anything would you consider yourself a generalist then uh well very much so in the sense that you know i'm i've been in a lot of different domains so i mean it's it's really fun for me I, you know i i've been in you know pilots and looking at helicopter navigation and emergency responders and and uh command you know military commanders and stuff so i get and doctors, we spend a lot of time with doctors in, in emergency rooms and stuff. And, and I get to go in and look over people's shoulders and, and learn how they're doing. So we're, I'm always going into domains where I'm novice. And, and, you know, part of in our software business and our software, you know, we've got to go into whatever domains 
our customers who are want to pay for new software. But but in order to build decision support systems, softwares for them, we've got to learn their domain. And so I'm constantly going into new domains and having to learn, you know, try to explore and the secrets of how these these people who've lived in the domain for 10 years, how they're doing, what they're how they're able to do the things that they do. Are you familiar with um the book The Neo Generalist by Kenneth Mickelson and Richard Martin? No, I'm not. Well, I think you would like it. It's um it's a, it's a the neo generalist idea is a form of polymath idea, and and one of the things they talk about is that people who are generalists also have a specialty that they apply within that that range that they're operating in, and and that describes what you're talking about that you bring this this particular set of skills and and understanding, and you're 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 applying it in all these different domains. As a way of understanding it in a particular way, um, for the benefit of the, your clients, and uh, I think that's that's really fascinating. And I think it's something that we can all learn from. You know that that's something that that our reach is far greater than maybe we think it is. And, uh, yeah. and we have to understand what what it is that we actually know that's our specialty, or really our niche knowledge that we can apply in other places. Yeah, well, I, I think that's accurate, but, you know, and, but how I got here was a series of accidents, not, not a deliberate. So, so when I went to study experimental psychology at Ohio State, you know, I was given a, a research assistantship and the professor that I was working for happened to be first an engineer. So he got his first degree in engineering and then got his PhD in psychology, but my first day in graduate school, he sat me in front of an analog computer and said, of course, you know, if you put two integrators back to back in a circuit, you get a sine wave out, right? Which as a psychologist who, you know, went to undergraduate thinking he was going to be a social worker, I didn't have a clue to. I hadn't had a calculus course at that point. So I spent much of my graduate career, you know, six years to get the PhD, but taking all the psych classes, but also taking engineering classes and mathematic classes so I could work in, we were, we were actually using classical control theory to model pilot performance in tracking tasks. And then when I got my PhD, my first job was, uh, was actually at the University of Illinois where I had, my major appointment was actually in mechanical industrial engineering. And I didn't even have an engineering degree. My PhD was in psychology. And I had a joint appointment with psychology and in the Institute of Aviation. So I had three departments, those three disciplines. So, so just the nature, you know, of our work with where we apply cognition is where humans and technology, you know, where people are doing complex work, which means you've got to understand the, the work, you have to understand the technology they're using, and then you also have to understand the expertise. And so that's kind of forced me to be open to a lot of perspectives. That's that's fascinating. And, you know, I see that in other people who you know, are able to to do what you have done. And um, so. Well, and just yeah. just one aspect of that story in yeah. terms of done it. I did not get tenure in that position. So I was six years and out. So. So I wasn't up to the task of, of satisfying all three masters in that in that situation. But but it certainly shaped how I approached the job. And, and even in my next position where it was major in a psychology department, I had joint part, you know, appointments with engineering and, and was always doing collaboration across, across departments. Well, that, did you get tenure there? Yes, then yeah, eventually became chair of the department. So it's, uh, there's a, so one of the lessons then is not just repetition, but the willingness to put yourself in a position where you have the potential to fail, but you fail to learn. I mean, you fail in order to learn, and you learn because you you figure out what doesn't work and what does work. is Is that a is that a part of this field that you're that you've been a part of? Well, nobody intends to fail, and and certainly, you know, when I took the a joint position in three departments, many people advised me that that was not possible. 
But of course, I was young and of course, well, it might not be possible for everybody else, but I thought, wow, this is perfect for me because I'm a perfect fit and I'm, it crosses my interest in a really intense way. And I was sure that I would make it work. So, you know, I don't think we ever set out for fail. I mean, I think it's, it's more in how we respond to fail, failure. And, and, you know, I have to say that when I didn't get tenure, I thought my career was over. And, and in my next position, you know, my aspirations were a lot lower and it was actually more uh, guided by, you know, moving back to Ohio where my wife's aging parents were so we could help take care for them. And I thought, well, my academic career is going to, is over in a sense, sense, you know, I was going to take an academic position, but I thought it was primarily going to be a teaching position, not a research, not a high visibility position. But it turned out that it was the perfect place for the next step. And, and you know, the things I learned at Illinois prepared me to, to make the next, next opportunity a lot more successful. But, uh, you know, I don't, it's, it's part of deliberate practice, I think, in terms of expertise is, is putting yourself in positions and not just, you know, not just repeating the things, you know, if you're learning to play music and not just doing the, the songs that you know and by heart over and over again. You also have to challenge yourself and try to pick up new chords or new styles in, in order to really get to expert, expert level. And so you, you've got to be able to, part of the practice has to be in places where you're uncomfortable and where, where you are vulnerable to failure. You know, as, a, as an inveterate learner um, at pretty significant uh, intensity, uh, when I hit my 70th birthday last week, I was thinking, what is it that I'm going to learn over the next 30 years till I'm 100? And, and, I, and I realized what I wanted to learn was um, how to play the piano and, and advanced math. Because uh, my, my math course when I was in college was, was from a book that was published in 1935. And so I don't think I learned much. And uh, and now I see all this all this math coming at me when I read stuff that I'm trying to read. So it so I I'm asking I'm, I guess I'm asking the question is so if this is not just repetition to get to a place in a career. This is maybe a different way of looking at how you live your life over the course of your entire life. Is that how how do you see that? Uh... Yeah, um, I guess the word I like is serious play. So, mm -hmm. you know, most of my choices have been dictated by this is more fun than, than something else. Uh, I've been been lucky to be able to play. And, and you know, when I, and, and, and part of playing is actually having friends. So, you know, I mean, I, the fact that, I survived the negative tenure decision was partly because a lot of people I met at Illinois uh, saw something uh, about my work that they liked and went out of their way to kind of, and in fact, I think maybe even because of what happened at Illinois. So some people thought, felt that, you know, perhaps maybe I didn't get it, you know, uh, wasn't as appreciated as much as I could. And, and so they kind of went overboard in the other way of, of reassuring me and helping me up and and opening up doors, opportunities for me. And even some of the people I worked with in Illinois, you know, went out of their way to create opportunities for me that that helped to advance my career later. Let's, uh, I want to move but to it's, some- Yeah, I, I mean- I, I want to move to ahead. something we um, touched on before we went on the air. Um, and that has to do with, the way the world views expertise and experts uh, today, and uh, and how in many respects there there's been a loss of respect for people who are who are experts uh, for various reasons, and uh, I w wonder what you would think would uh, would uh, what do you think about that in, in, as we look at the world of today? That I think uh, the problem is specialization, and partly that's. Uh, a product of the universities and departmentation, specialization in universities. And, and almost, most disciplines think that they've grown so much, there's so much information that there's no time for their students to take any courses outside. You know, they fill their 
curriculum with requirements, and there's no, there's not very much opportunity for students to explore broadly in their education early. Rather than reducing the world to the the things we understand, we should be understand expanding our understanding to the world. But I think a lot of specialists can only see, you know, with the lens of their models and their specialization, and they have, and and so they tend to miss parts of the world, important parts of the world that aren't covered by their specialization. So um, and, you and I are, and, and you you and I are are roughly the same age, and um, and we almost both exactly looking, we were born the same year. We and we're looking to the future, you know, as elders. I mean, we're elders in the in culture in our culture. So this idea of of, of having uh, what's your your term about play? Um, serious play. Serious play. It's, so how does how does a person who is, uh, say, is, enter is entering retirement uh, move into a, a, a pattern of serious play for their, their last decades of their, of their life? What do you recommend? Well, so the problem, well, I th think the problem is you shouldn't have to wait till you're retired to do When you're retired, you actually have a unique opportunity because, you know, if, yeah. if you don't have to worry about your income, you don't have to worry about a boss. And you don't have to worry about selling, you know, yourself to customers so much. Then you can do, you can follow your curiosity wherever it leads, and follow your follow your joy. Uh, to me, the problem is is that's what should we should be doing for eighteen year olds. That's what college should be about. College should be a time to experiment and go many different directions and stuff. But, but you know, and and in fact, I would say that even before college, I mean, already. You know, when, when you and I were in high school, Ed, you know, if you were interested in sports, you probably played, you know, baseball in the summer, football in the fall, and basketball in the winter. Okay, today, they're at six and seven year old, they're telling kids that, well, if you want to be at the highest level of soccer, you've got to go play soccer year round, and you can't play basketball, you can't that's do right. other sports. And, you know, we've just become over specialized. And, that, you know, that's it's the same thing, you know, people are Saying, you know, if you want to be a doctor, you know, you got a special, you got a pre, you got to declare a pre -med, med major, you know, you got a major in chemistry and stuff. And you don't have time for literature class or, you know, you, you don't have time to take a class just because you think it might be fun. You know, it's not, you got to be serious. And, and I think again, that people get tracked way too early in specializations. And it's difficult for a lot of people to break out of that. You know, I, I don't think the people who break out of it, you know, are, are smarter or stuff. You know, for me, it was, you know, I didn't say, okay, I, I want to do serious play. I just, I think the big specialized. And more about following your curiosity at all ages. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and, and that's the thing is, is people, you will get mentored very early that, well, just because you're interested in it, you know, you got to think about your career. You got to look at your future and, and, uh, you know, for example, as a young professor, you know, they tell you, you know, work on problems that you can publish that, so you know, you can publish. Well, you only know you can publish it if your readers will read. But if you're doing anything on the fringes, publication is a really risky business. And they'll say, say well, save that till after you get tenure. But yeah, I, I could never, I was never that disciplined. I, I, you're playing I just, for some reason, I just. I was, yeah, I was more interested in having fun than in yeah, my career. I appreciate that. And and partly, I, partly I think I was free because I did fail at Illinois because I got to the other side and realized, hey, I failed and the world didn't end. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I think, I, I guess I kind of had the idea that, well, the worst things already happened to me, so... So I, I don't have I don't have to worry about the risk anymore. I can't I can't afford to to explore. Yeah, I, I totally I totally get that. And you know, when I went to college, I remember my my freshman year, I was taking a, a history course, a literature course, a, a religion course, and I'm thinking, oh, this is all so narrow. And and how do, how am I going to do four years of this? And I it felt painful. You know, and oh. you know the 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 degree of of detail that was 
being thrust at me was not the way I thought. I was a big picture guy. I was an integrationist. And and I and ultimately I found the Department of American Studies, which allowed me to study whatever I wanted to. And uh that's that's the way it ended up. So um and then, you know, and then then for my well, failure, it was the failure to to not understand that I was working for someone and and my energy and my curiosity and all that had become a problem with my bosses. And so it was time to leave. I mean, it was uh, at some point I had to go work for myself. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, yeah. So I started biochem major and really didn't like it. Didn't, you know, wasn't, it just wasn't serious play. <laughs> I, I was I didn't even know the word then, but, but I didn't like it. And I went home my sophomore year at Christmas and told my mom, my mother that I was quitting college. There was no point in college for me. And my mother said, okay, if that's what you want to do, but you cannot quit in the middle of the year, you've got to go back and finish out your sophomore year. Good for her. And, but, so I went back my second half of sophomore year thinking that I didn't have to worry about a major. And so I asked all my friends, who is the best professor that you have? Oh. You had, and who, and I figured I, I'm going to leave the college, so I might as well meet the interesting people. So whatever those people were teaching, and I took a course in anthropology and a course in, yeah, in, in uh, uh, you know, personal finance because I thought I'd have to know something about money when I le left college, and and you know I took the the most interesting people, and I went from you know dragging myself out of bed and skipping a lot of classes and going in for the tests in the first part of sophomore year to getting up every morning, running in the morning, going to my classes, reading ahead in my classes. Um, and yeah, I, I ended up, one of the courses was anthropology and that was the chair of the psych department. And he and I became close personal friends. I ended up living with him and his family of 11 kids as a kind of a Charles in charge wow. from my junior and senior year. And that's why I changed majors. But But it was when I, it was that shift of going back to school without a, you know, without the need to worry about a major that gave me the freedom to follow my curiosity. You know, I didn't, I didn't deliberately follow my curiosity, but it just as I, I lost that focus, you know, that the world said you had to have. And that, that made a huge difference. And that's where I discovered psychology. And, and it was, it's really more than psychology because it's, 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 uh, sort of the connecting tissue to a whole lot of other domains that um, has given you this really broad and very interesting career that you've had. Yeah, it's again, and it was more or less a happy accident. Again, you know, you know some people talk about flow and stuff and, and uh, you know, I, it's for me, it's right. You know, I feel like my career is kind of a, you know, a leaf adrift and, and, you know, I, I let the, let the flow take me where I ended up. It wasn't, wasn't kind of a month, you know, choosing the direction, but, but it's really kind of going with the flow and, and taking advantage of the, uh, that happy accidents that, that happened along the way. I feel, I'll very, feel very much the same. And, um, I never would have predicted that I would end up where I am today or where I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or even 30 years ago. I mean, it's none of it's predictable. But if you I think if you follow your. Your I hate to use the word pass, not your passion, but your curiosity and you follow what what you enjoy and you and you seek to understand it and to um, make sense of it, I think you'll you'll find that every every moment of transition becomes one of opportunity rather than one of dread. Yeah, and you know, curiosity, and and I, I would have said maybe uh, not too long ago that curiosity is the key thing, but I think more it's joy. And, 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 and so, I mean, do you, that, and, I, and I, so the other aspect of cognition is, you know, when I started, it was focused on logic and the, but one of the things I've come to appreciate is the effect of dimensions and, uh, you know, our emotions are 
actually better, maybe in some ways better tuned to the reality of the world than our logical brain. And so, you know, when something is, is fun, I or when you're enjoying something, that's actually telling you that it's healthy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to a certain extent. I mean, you know, and, and, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, following our joy is, it kind of will, so, you know, curiosity and finding out puzzles, solving puzzles are fun. And it's, it, curiosity kind of seems more logical and joy kind of seems hedonistic, but, but I think, I think our emotions are often better tuned to the realities of the world. And, and even when we're doing things that are supposed to be fun, um, that are bad for us, we know <laughs> we, we don't have that same sense of joy that we do when we're doing things that are really good for us. You know, when you're training, when you're performing as an athlete at a high level, there's a, there's a sense of joy that you can't get uh, anywhere else. I totally agree with you. So let me, let me ask you this question. Um, as a cognitive psychologist, applied co cognitive psychologist, get that correct. To what, to what extent have you um, engaged with the study of um, uh, neuroscience and brains and, and the makeup of the brain and the, you know, the brain mind question and, you know, those kinds of questions. Yeah. So I, you know, that I, I don't want to undercut the neuroscience and the brain stuff, but I, but I also, you know, when, in all my experiences with expertise is the answers are, it's more important to understand the work and the domain. So you look, so if you want to understand skill of baseball, you got to understand baseball. You got to understand the game. You got to start. And so my approach to psychology that from the very beginning has been ecological psychology. And, and that starts with the, the information is in the world, not in the head. And, and so the classical view is, is that, you know, the eye is two dimensional. So the only way we can get around in the three dimensional world is, is if we reconstruct the world in our brain and we, and we deal with this reconstructed brain. But, you know, I, my early work was inspired by James Gibson, who showed that actually much of the information that allows us to move through the world and, and that allow pilots to land an airplane and stuff is totally available. It's in angulars and angular relationships on a two-dimensional retina. So you don't have to reinvent 3D. You can actually see the three-dimensional world. You can see when something's coming at you, it expands. That's yeah. because it's angular projection. And so all the information you need to run through the world skillfully is in the world. And so, so I, you know, it's very interesting and it's important for me to see interesting parallels in the neuroscience, but I don't, I kind of laugh at the people who start with the neuroscience and the brain and think they're going to understand cognition from looking inside the head. And one of the people, the Gibsonians framed it, Bill Mays framed it is what Gibson want to understand is what the head's inside of. And most of my career has been focused on that, what the head's inside of. And so I, mm -hmm. I feel like the field is actually overbalanced in, in favor of people who look inside the head and look at the neuroscience and, and just to kind of get back to balance. I always laugh at those people and say, it's just me. It's just me. If you really want to understand cognition, you got to look at, 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 because and and actually, let me see. The world, the the brain is incredibly plastic, mm -hmm. and so if certain parts of the brain are destroyed, other parts will take on functionality that's important to survival in the world. And so my view is is the brain is an adaptive system. It's and if you want to understand the structures in the brain, you have to understand the world that the brain has adapted to. Mm -hmm. and there's there's a uh, a, a story, I, I think it's, uh, God, I'm blocking on the author, very famous author, but he talks about uh, an organism, a, a sea squirt. And in the first phase of its life, it was swimming around, but at later phase, it attaches itself to a, a rock and essentially now becomes stationary and functions is more like a plant. Well, when it fixes itself and becomes stationary, it starts eating its brain. 
oh. because brains are expensive and and uh, it's Gregory Bateson tells the story so yeah. and what he says is is the function of the brain is to allow us to move around the world and if we don't have to move around in the world we don't need a brain and and so but uh but my feeling is is a brain is a reflection if you really want to understand the structure of the brain you need to understand what value it has for survival in the world and so what problems was the brain designed to solve in the world and so i always start with the problems in the world not with the brain i i agree with it and i and i see that part of the dilemma that we face here in the modern world in regards to science is that it, it was the opposite you know we're going to reduce things down to their atomistic level and try to understand the world from that point of view which i don't think we can understand the whole, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I really am a Polyanian in this regard. So yeah. I, I see that, that the particulars are not, are not defining the whole or the comprehensive whole as he calls it, but rather the comprehensive whole defines the particulars. And, uh, and yeah. so what is that comprehensive whole, which is the, the environment we live in, the bigger picture, the, the whole thing, reality, what, you know, all those different concepts are trying to, to grasp hold of this, large environment whatever you want to call it that we are in, we enter into it physically cognitively seeking to understand it and yep. to live in it. uh we just had this conversation with mark mcgrath you know in relationship to the ooda loop and 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 one of the things that the people who understand closed loop dynamics understand this but it's often implicit and it's not well represented in any of the diagrams the loop is closed through the world yeah, that is, you know, you, you, your eyes inform your hands through the light, and you're seeing the world, and your hands are interacting with the world. But the world is inside that loop. It's part of that loop. It's not right. external. The world's not external. It's part of. So the system. So we're a perception action system, and perception connects to action through the world. And so the world is very much part of that whole, and and. You know, Ponch and, and and Mark also, you know, wholeheartedly agree with that, but it's it's not so well reflected in their diagrams. You know, you don't include the, you know, the opponent that you're adapting to that you're trying to get inside the OODA loop. That's got to be it's it's their reactions to what you do that allow you to close the loop. Well, I'm working on a framework related to reality because I felt you know I feel like we have. We live in a world that's denying that reality is real, and, uh, and so I'm working on this framework, and and it's it's three tiers, and it begins with um, the concrete world, the built world, the uh, the world that human beings have created, um, uh, the cultural world, and the, the next level up is the abstract world, the intellectual world, where thought is um, is cre the creative thought then results in something uh, tangibly cr concrete. And above that is is what I'm calling the spiritual realm, which is really the realm of relationships of, of consciousness of reality, and that that is the overarching thing. And as and I like to I like to draw diagrams to try to uh, illustrate the relationship. And I'm, I haven't yet figured out how to draw that diagram because it's exactly what you're saying is that the the abstract and the concrete are operating inside that that uh, that that realm of relationship, that realm of consciousness, that realm of reality. And um, so I'm st I still got to work on that, but that's, but that's what I'm, you know, I see as, as, um, as a way of kind of recovering from this, this sense that um, expertise has been too, too narrowly defined or confined by our perception of the world. And, and that's, that's one of the challenges that we face, I think here in the 21st century. Yeah, so that's the, you might want to look at some of the things, some of my blogs on polycentric control, and I will. and I I come to exactly the same conclusion that and the way I think about it, and and this is you know classical rationality is talking about causes, but the way dynamic systems work is about constraints, and so what you describe as the highest level, that's our value system. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that matter and are meaningful to us. So those are things that are attractive, that we think are beautiful things. And, and those set the goals and they set the constraints 
for what our processes need to do. You know, they set the, they set the constraints and they tell you what possibilities are, are interesting, what things you're going to be attracted to, what things you want to you want to avoid, what are the risks, and then and then at the lower level, we have to translate that into action, and that's where the you know where we begin to move through the world to get to the things that that are attractive and avoid the things that are that are risky or unattractive. But but each prop you know each each outer layer sets the bound kind of boundary conditions for what's important inside the next layer. Right. Which then that's exactly right. Yeah, and well, there's yeah that three layer. Uh, has been reinvented by many people over and over again. And one that I like is Jens Rasmussen, and he calls the top layer level the knowledge-based interactions, the middle level rule-based interactions. So those are the kind of tricks. And then the, the bottom level is the skill-based interactions. Yeah, I like, I like that. And each, but each one kind of sets, you know, the knowledge picks, tells you what rules apply in this situation in terms of your value system, you know, when you need to be polite, when you need to be kind. Or versus when you need to be honest, for example, and then and then the the rules tell you how to behave, and then the the lower level controls, you know, like actually how you can articulate the words and move and say do the things that you need to do. There's 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 very much a hierarchy there, and I see that hierarchy. And what what kind of led me to this is the is what I felt like was the was the flipping of the hierarchy, so that the culture become you know dictates thought and dictates uh, relationship rather than the other way around. Yeah, I, I get, and the the thing is, it's it's a coupled system. Yeah. So so when you when you talk about one dictating to the other, that kind of reflects a cause, which is which is linear. So cause always implies that something came before the cause, always something prior. But in mm -hmm. a circle, there is no prior. So it's the values are intimately coupled with our rules and our regulation. You know, our culture is in, in coupled right. with how we think. But it's but to say that one determines the other, I think, is wrong. It's they co-determine. They they complement each other, and and that you can and this is where the holistic you can't understand one without understanding the other. You have to each one. The lower levels have to be understood in the context of the upper levels, but similarly the upper levels need need to be understood in, in in relationship to the lower levels and i think what i'm was what i'm seeing is that there is um a sort of idealistic picture of that which is what you just described but then there's a corrupted picture of that where um whether it's human will or whatever it is it it uh, forces um conflict into that and uh, it's it's there's a there was a conversation on LinkedIn uh, earlier, maybe it was yesterday, talking about um, you know people in relationship where one has to be right and the other has to be wrong. And you know my comment was, wouldn't it be better if we just figured out how to learn from each other? Yeah. And, well, and that's yeah, that's something that that I picked up from Alan Rayner. Yeah. So the the idea, I mean, and and you know, raised in academic environments, it was always about winning the argument. It was always either or. So if I'm right, then you got to be wrong. Right. And and it's it's this dialectic, this either or logic. And and you know, Alan put it into words beautiful with his natural inclusion when he says, "Hey, they're all both and. Every problem is a both and. It's not either or. And and the multiple perspectives." And again, that goes back to the multidisciplinary being able to explore cross boundaries of specializations and things that you know, you know, academic specializations they justify their funding by saying that well, engineering is more important than psychology, or psychology is more you know every every department thinks there's the most important department in the university, yeah, and they have answers that everybody else doesn't have, but. Uh, and it and again it becomes a university becomes a collection of silos rather than a a community of of scholars trying to explore the world in interesting ways. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Well, John, this has been uh, this has been wonderful and fascinating, and um, appreciate uh, you taking the time today to to have a conversation with me. And I feel like we've started 
conversation that will extend um, into the future and um, wish you well on your birthday when that comes up soon and I hope that you have as much fun as I did on mine and um, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I really uh, appreciate and flattered that you invited me to talk and and uh, yeah, I, I think we're on a very similar path and and we We've each learned some, some very similar things in our 70 years <laughs> on this And the planet. fact that you and I are on a similar path with Alan Rayner um, is probably the uh, the most uh, mind-blowing thing that I can imagine, because I have great respect for him. Uh, I do, too. Uh, so we, we will move on. And thank you. And um, we'll, uh, yeah, I just uh, thank you for coming on. And I have. I've learned a lot and I appreciate your insight and I appreciate what you've done and, and the model you, that you, I mean, you, I know you're not intentionally doing this in, the, in what you're saying, but you, you're, um, for many people, you can't, you're a model, you represent a way of, of approaching work and career that other people should um, pay attention to. And just to, to offer that affirmation and to serious play uh that's that's a great thing and that's that's the way i view what i do too so yeah and and i should attribute that uh oh gosh now i just blocked on his his name but serious play is a title oh michael schrag wrote a book titled serious play okay and he argued that that's how companies innovate that I is agree. you know it's it's by playing around with technology and discovering it's it's kind of an acceptation process rather than a you know deliberate ad innovation process you, you that's true that's true yeah but yeah and i would say you know preparing for this you know i i listened to a lot of your podcasts and i've learned a lot saw a lot of friends saw some people that i didn't know about but now i want to know more about who who said some very interesting things so i i really i think this podcast is a great thing and i thank you well it's been a it's been an interesting journey i didn't know where it would go um you know, I've got a lot of people are scheduled to be interviewed and and um, I just, you know, take a follow the string out, see where it heads and um, and learn from it. So and I, you know, I'm sure that I'll have you back on again in the in the future because I, I think we haven't exhausted our conversation. And, yeah, that'd be great. So thank you very much, John. And thank you, everyone, for watching. I hope that you have you're taking away something which will be beneficial to you in your life. And if you have um, something that you'd like to offer, a question or a thought, please put it in the, uh, you know, offer that in the in the box where you can put questions and make your comments. And please subscribe and like, hit the like button. And we'll see you again the next time on the Eddie Network podcast. Thank you and thank you, John. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.